Welcome to the Mount Zion Church Bible Study. My name is Reverend Wendell Webster, and today we're coming from the book of Genesis, the 30th chapter, verses 14 through verses 24, and we've entitled this lesson, Jacob is Hired by Leah with Love Apples. Won't you please bow your heads with a word of prayer? O oh, gracious, all-wise, and eternal God, our Father, we come today asking you, God, to come into our midst and to be a blessing to us. We thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for starting us yet on our way. We thank you for providing all of our needs. We thank you, God, for granting us blessings uh, new to us this morning, mercies, and all that you do to bless your people. God, we give you praise, and we give you honor, and we give you glory for this time, and we pray that you will be in our midst imparting wisdom, knowledge, and power that we may leave here better than we came with greater understanding, greater levels of knowing you and always understanding, God, that you are sovereign in your wisdom and wise in your uh, providence. And so, Father, thank you for what you've done, what you will do and what you have yet to do in our lives, because we know that it's all for the good. So bless this Bible study and we will forever give your name praise, honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So Genesis, the 30th chapter, beginning at the 14th verse, we find these words. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But he said to her, "It is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. 
When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. And God heeded Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my hire because I gave my maid to my husband. So she named him Issachar. And Leah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good dowry. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and named her Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel, and God heeded her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son, and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she named him Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. Let's start out by talking about mandrakes, the power of love apples. Love apples. The days of wheat harvest, which are talked about in the 14th verse of our 30th chapter uh, in Israel, were during the months of March or April. During this time in our text, the oldest child, Reuben, the son of Leah, went in the field and found a yellow fruit that grew near the ground and looked like a tomato. They were called love apples translated as mandrakes. They were believed to increase fertility, and she haggled with Leah, Rachel did, over them. However, the fruit had little to do with Rachel's ability to birth a son. It was God's doing, as we will see. So more on these love apples. Mandrakes have no stalk but it has large leaves and violet flowers. Ripens, like I said, in somewhere around March or April, and the Greek goddess of sex and love, Aphrodite, was called the lady of the mandrakes. And even in our Bible, in the Song of Songs, the seventh chapter, verses 12 and 13, the word is used in wordplay, and this is in the Hebrew, and it says, I will give you my love, and love in this context is translated dode. The mandrakes was a dudaim, give forth fragrance, O oh my beloved, dode. So these three words, dode and uh, dudaim and dode are all a wordplay which is significant in poetic writing and things of that nature uh, in, uh, in, in Israel, Israeli writings. So uh, uh, really these mandrakes were supposed to be, you know, increased fertility, made a man able to uh, uh, make babies, we'll say. And so uh, though the conversation between Rachel and Leah uh, was to determ determine which one would sleep with Jacob, it's not clear if the mandrakes even played a part. Uh, and so Rachel received the mandrakes in exchange for allowing Leah her turn with Jacob. So these mandrakes were supposed to be good in making, uh, uh, allowing a man to make children. But it's not clear, again, if the mandrakes played a part. So in view of Rachel's request for some, again, some mandrakes, uh, Leah probably kept some for herself saying, let me have these and not give them all away. Uh, so Leah gave birth to Issachar, her fifth son, a name that sounds like the Hebrew word for reward. With Issachar, Leah felt that this son was her payment for having given her maid to Jacob. Now we see the introduction of, of, of the first female to be born, uh, Dinah. Uh, so later, before, however, before Dinah's birth, uh, Leah's sixth son, Zebulun, was born. 
And he was named Zebulun because Leah believed that he was a valuable gift and would cause Jacob to treat her with honor. And that's found in that 20th verse. Uh, and then Genesis 30 and 21 now becomes very curt and short in its description of the birth of a daughter by the name of Dinah. And we don't know why she was named Dinah, possibly because she was a daughter and daughters were not given that much relevance in the ancient Near East, in the ancient Near East, or because the meaning, which is vindication, was rather obvious to the first readers of, of the Holy Text. And so we don't we have no real reason, but vindication uh, is, 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 is uh, resounding in its theme there. And normally we know daughters were not mentioned, a very patriarchal society. But in this case, the author was preparing readers for a later event, which is going to take place, take place in Genesis, the 34th chapter. And so uh, Dinah uh, needed a proper introduction uh, for what we'll talk about in probably a few weeks when we get down to the 34th chapter. I don't want to uh, give, give too much away. So now we see Joseph is born. Now, uh, uh, and then we know Joseph really carries the, 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 the rest of the story. It's his bloodline kind of that then uh, begins to uh, populate and expand somewhat. And so this section in Genesis closes with Rachel finally happy. Now Rachel is overjoyed. Uh, uh, she bore a son because God remembered her. That's what the text says, God remembered her. And I don't want you to underestimate the phraseology there that God remembers, that God has not forgotten you no matter what your situation, no matter what your circumstance, God has not forgotten you, no matter what you may be facing now, even in the midst of this pandemic, God has not forgotten you. God will remember you and not only remember you, but reward you. And so uh, uh, God, the text says that God remembered uh, uh, Rachel. And so uh, uh, the Rachel's time span of misery, I want to kind of highlight this because I want you to know sometimes you have to wait to be remembered if you can accept that. Rachel's time span of misery was most likely the entire seven year period of her marriage where she was unable to bear children, yet her sister Leah and Leah's maid and Rachel's own maid were all able to bear Jacob's sons. And she was glad that her time had come. And, and uh, that's a, a good because uh, oh, uh, God does not allow any of us live out the totality of our lives in too much misery. God does bring joy about if we're willing to seek it out and, and see what God is doing in our lives. God does provide us with joy and not always uh, and, and never, I don't, well, I don't want to say never, but misery is not really uh, a part of God's plan for our lives. So here now Rachel is exuberant and overjoyed because she now bears a son. So Joseph's name signified for Rachel that God had taken away her disgrace. And she mentioned that in the 23rd verse, God had taken away her disgrace by giving her favor, by blessing her with the son, Joseph. And so let's look at the possible meanings of what Joseph's name is. The name Joseph has two possible Hebrew origins. The first word is Asaph, meaning to take away. The second, the Hebrew word Yasaf means to add. So adding one letter means two opposite things here. Asaph, to take away. Yasaf, meaning to add. Rachel uses the word Yasaf in this verse, suggesting that she viewed it as related to that word meaning to add. However, we can still look further into the text because both terms to add and to take away become pertinent in the life of Joseph. First of all, if Joseph's names come from the Hebrew word Asaph, it alludes to the loss of Joseph by way of the treachery of his brothers. When his brothers threw him into the pit, sold him to the travelers and then he ends up in Potiphar's house. And so if that legacy, would, uh, which is true, 
uh, has to deal with this word or this the way his name comes from, then it therefore alludes to the treachery uh, uh, and the loss uh, of Joseph. And we know that Jacob was was a bit uh, um, saddened by the loss of Joseph. And so, if Joseph's name derives from Yasab, with Yasab, which is the uh, uh, the word that means to add, then it's, it is referring to his being added to the family through Rachel, who was formerly barren. And we know this barren um, context uh, uh, was with Sarah and that kind of thing. And so uh, barrenness is, 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 is uh, something that every woman sought to overcome, especially in the ancient Near East. Children were a badge of honor. So let's finally look at some commonalities with the Abraham story. Uh, the first thing is this, Rachel struggles to gain the upper hand over Leah. Just like Jacob triumph over Esau, Cain versus Abel, Isaac versus Ishmael, and even the current story that will be upcoming, Joseph and his brothers. All of that, uh, 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 Rachel struggles to gain that upper hand over Leah, the younger overtaking the older, uh, um, uh, the, the lesser, you know, trying to get what the older should get, and all these kinds of things come through in this story. Secondly, Rachel's desperate appeal, give me children or otherwise I shall die. That kind of echoes Jacob's demand to Laban to give me my wife that he said after um, having labored for seven years. And even Esau's plea for blessings from Isaac uh, over back in the 27th chapter, uh, of this desperate appeal um, comes through its commonality with the story. And then in proposal that her maid Bella should bear children for her, Rachel adopts the same language as Sarah does before her. And then there are two others um, that are apparently my slide. We're going to move on from those two. And so uh, uh, those are some of the commonalities that we see uh, with the story. So now let's talk about them in closing this out. Rachel followed Joseph's naming with a prayer for the future. And that prayer was, may the Lord add to me another son. That was her plea that ended our text today. And, and, and sometimes we have to be careful what we ask for. And I don't know if this is, you know, I, I, I'm not assuming that this is as a result, but we do know that later on in the story that in time, God answers Rachel's prayer, but it comes at a very significant cost. It costs Rachel her life. And so we're going to pick up on that in subsequent chapters. And then, and then while God did not inspire the writer of Genesis to condemn polygamy, he surely shows the disasters that polygamy can bring. And, and, and we even know, even in America, we have some places where polygamy is, is supposedly practiced. Uh, and, and while they consent to live this way, I can only believe the little uh, many problems that must exist in some of the households with trying to live in a um, polygamous kind of state. Uh, and then, uh, but when looking at the imperfect people of Genesis, when viewing the, all that they went through and everything and all the sins they struggled against uh, and, and trying to um, uh, bring about God's divine plan, it's always interesting that God's will was done despite their sinfulness nor their goodness. So it wasn't their sinful nature nor their goodness side that got, uh, that allowed God's will to come. It's merely God's will, God's grace. And, 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 and God's grace is made available based on human merit and his abiding mercy. Always recognize that his grace uh, is based on you need to try somewhat. Don't think that uh, uh, everything will, will not require any effort at all. So you must put some merit and some toil in. But God's abiding mercy always allows his grace not only to be there, but to be sufficient for whatever it is you're going through. And so realize that God's grace is made available through our own merit and toil and the abiding mercy of God our Father. So that concludes our lesson today. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I would just tell you to ponder these thoughts. Uh, ponder the thought that God's grace 
in spite of all that we've been through and are going through, God's grace is still sufficient and still provides and protects. Think about our own families or the families we're seeing uh, uh, right now in our uh, cities and communities, especially in our cities where, where joblessness is high. We're seeing the family structure breaking down and, 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 and we're seeing as some of our young ladies competing for the affections of men by having children and, and that kind of thing. And I'm just so thankful for the STEM initiatives that are targeting girls and other programs targeting young ladies to help them to see clearer and see that there is a possibility for them. So I thank you for tuning in today. Uh, any questions, reach out to me at pastorwebster at gmail.com or at the church, uh, uh, Mount Zion AME in Daytona Beach, Florida, area code 386. 252-2412. May God bless you and may God keep you is my prayer.